What I'd like to do this morning as we move through this story together is to keep Psalm 45 in the back of our minds. Carl read a snippet mentioning that, that myrrh and that aloes in Cassia, which isn't in this passage, but we've been looking at the fact that John, when he includes a detail, is significant. He includes certain details, geographical details, other details that some of the other gospel writers don't include, and uh, that the other gospel writers didn't think it necessary. So John has a reason for including these details. And uh, it's a safe bet, and yes, sometimes we can read into the scriptures and try to find things that aren't really there, but it's a safe bet that when John mentions details like myrrh and aloes, that it's a wise idea to click on that and follow that white rabbit and see where it leads you. Because that white rabbit always leads you to the riches of the gospel and the love of Christ. So that's what we're going to do this morning. So I want to dial in on the myrrh and aloes and then expand back to look at this story in light of Psalm 45. So when, I, when we think about the scent of the king, the first aspect of that is the scent of the king is really the scent of death. The scent of death. Let's look at this again. Verse 40. Then they took the body of Jesus and bound it in strips of linen with the spices as the custom of the Jews is to bury. Back up to 39. And Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds. Okay? We're going to go forwards and backwards in redemptive history in this sermon. Okay? We're going to switch back and forth. Okay? We go to Psalm 45 and Carl read, all your garments are scented with myrrh and aloes and cassia. Uh, myrrh, and you know, Jesus was given myrrh at his birth, so obviously it wasn't like buying a styrofoam cup at the store and giving that to someone. This is valuable stuff. These magi from the east brought myrrh, which was expensive. It was expensive. And then aloes are, they're not the aloes that you break open and stick on a sunburn. They're actually from, a, uh, they're called, also called agar wood. They're from a particular tree that grows in India, that grows in Cambodia. Shout out to Savant, I'm not here this morning, but... <laughs> Uh, and that grows in Vietnam and other countries, but it wasn't growing in Nicodemus's backyard. And this particular spice of aloes is one of the most expensive spices in the world. They say it's worth its weight in gold. Um, the, in its purest form, I read that a kilogram could be $100,000. And they anointed Jesus' body with these spices. And these spices being royal spices from Psalm 45 were now, as is the custom of the Jews, though they didn't use 100 pounds of this stuff normally, was really the smell of death. It was the smell of a funeral. It was a sweet-smelling smell, at least to them at the time. And by the way, I went to this like new agey health store on North Druid Hills and got this perfume of agar wood. If you're interested in smelling it now, it may not smell exactly like the other stuff because this isn't, this is like not the, the pure stuff, you know, it's been cut as I said, right? <laughs> but it's got kind of a smoky smell to it. And then I've got essential oil of myrrh. And so after church, if you want, you can smell them just for kids. And it smells, smells good. I like the myrrh better than the, than the agar wood. But they were mixed together. And this was the smell of a funeral. But the fact that they brought a hundred pounds, a, a Jewish writer later would say, perhaps mocking the story, that that's what you would bring to bury 200 people. Not a hundred I mean, not one person. And so what you see here is that literally this burial is the burial fit for a king. 
King Asa in the Old Testament, when it talks about him being buried, was buried with a ton of different spices. And these spices, this was not an embalming like the Egyptians. It was not to preserve the body. It was to sweeten the smell of the air, but also, I believe, hints at the resurrection. That there's something beautiful. There's, there's the scent of life to come placed upon the dead body of a human. That this is not the end. This is not the end. And so, to honor Jesus, they gave him literally a kingly burial. Uh, we see here as well that obviously, uh, fulfilling Isaiah 53, he was, he was killed with the wicked, but he was buried with the rich at his death. And in God's providence, since it was the preparation day, they were in a hurry to, to bury him when they took him off the cross. And Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea, we find out in other Gospels, this was actually his own tomb. He was a wealthy man. Most people didn't have, like, you know, carved in tombs with a stone roll over them. It was in this garden. He had a really nice burial plot. And in God's providence, because it was close by and they had to do this quickly because they had to bury him before sundown. God fulfilled this prophecy that he was buried with the rich at his death. He was, he was killed shamefully with criminals, but he was buried with a king's burial, in a sense. There wasn't the pomp, but there were the elements of a kingly burial there. So we see first that this is the smell of death, that these, al that these aloes and, and myrrh were the smell of a funeral. Okay? The second thing we see is that it's the scent of life. I want us to look back at Psalm 45 together. It's the scent of death, but it's also the scent of life. Resurrection life. Psalm 45. Now I'm just going to read this whole song to you, so hang in. To the chief musician, set to the lilies, a contemplation of the sons of Korah, a song of love. Now knowing what is happening in John chapter 19, may the Holy Spirit give you new eyes to see Psalm 45. My heart is overflowing with a good theme. I recite my composition concerning the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. This is a love poem. You are fairer than the sons of men. Grace is poured upon your lips. Therefore, God has blessed you forever. Gird your sword upon your thigh, O mighty one. Right? There's war in here. There's romance. And there's war in here, right? Gird your sword upon your thigh, O mighty one. With your glory and your majesty. This is what's going on in Carl's bike. Uh, uh, and in your majesty, you pros ride prosperously because of truth, humility, and righteousness. And your right hand shall teach you awesome things. Your arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies. The peoples fall under you. And then it start, you know, it keeps going. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you. Who is this? Jesus Christ, the divine Son of God, who the author of Hebrews, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, applies this to Jesus Christ. How can you have one person being called God and then God anoints that person who is just called God? God, it's called the Trinity, and it's in the Old Testament. Amen. God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Your throne, O God, is, a, is forever and ever. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you. How can you have a throne that's forever? Tell me a king who has had a throne that's forever. Only Jesus. Because Jesus is the only king that was going to be resurrected to rule unable to die anymore. So there, there is resurrection prophecy in here. Does that make sense? If you can say your throne, O God, is forever and ever, you ain't going to die anymore, right? So what do we have? Let's keep going. All your garments are scented with myrrh and aloes and cassia. Okay, back up. 
Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions, symbolic of the Holy Spirit. The oil of gladness. You know, kings were anointed with special anointing oil, and myrrh and maybe aloes, I can't remember, were part of the spices that were put in that oil. And it says, out of the ivory palaces by which they have made you glad. King's daughters are among your honorable women. At your right hand stands the queen in gold from Ophir. Now here's the summon to us, right? To the church, to, to the elect as God calls his one bride to himself. Listen, O daughter, consider and incline your ear. Forget your own people also in your father's house. So the king will greatly desire your beauty. Because he is your Lord, worship him. And the daughter of Tyre will come with the gift. The rich among the people will seek your favor. Right? The popular girls will come in and honor you. Right? Verse 13. The royal daughter is all glorious within the palace. Her clothing is woven with gold. She shall be brought to the king in robes of many colors. Right? We have the robe of Christ's righteousness covering us. The virgins, her companions who follow her, shall be brought to you. With gladness and rejoicing they shall be brought. They shall enter the king's palace. Instead of your fathers shall be your sons, whom you shall make princes in all the earth. I will make your name to be remembered in all generations. Therefore the people shall praise you forever and ever. This is God on the throne, the divine Son of God. King Jesus prophesied as the risen, eternal king. But get this. Okay, we're going back and forth. I could be wrong here. I know I say that a lot, but I do want to say this. This is a little speculative. But knowing that God is in eternity, and, and everything is open and naked before him in all time, everything is present before him in his all-knowingness, right? His, his omniscience. God, the same Spirit, inspired Psalm 45 and John 19. And so if you go back and forth a little, yes, kings had these kind of expensive perfumes on their garments, but in God's providence, what did this living king smell like? What did he smell like? Shout it out. Do the math and shout it out. What did he smell like? What was our first point? Let me give you a hint. What? What? Yeah, but what What was the significance of aloes and myrrh? Death. The only, right? Listen, he's alive and he smells like a funeral. Right after God said, your throne of God is forever and ever. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companion. What does that point us to? That the scent of death on Jesus is also the scent of life because he's a living man who still smells like the funeral. Who else can experience that? Does that make sense? You got, does that make sense? Yeah. He smells like a funeral in Psalm 45, and he's alive. This points us to the cross. Let's go back to John. It points us to the cross because he wouldn't stay in that tomb with that myrrh and aloes and having anointed his body. He would rise up and he would sit on the throne of the whole universe to rule until all his enemies are made a footstool for his feet either by conversion or destruction and judgment. And so this, the, the, the myrrh and the aloes are the scent of death, the scent of a funeral, but they're also the scent of life. Those spices pointing to the resurrection find their fulfillment on the garments of the living, risen Christ. The one who smells like death is alive forevermore. Therefore, the scent of death becomes the scent of life in Jesus Christ. And lastly, it's the scent of love. The scent of love. If you just, again, if you click on 
Myrrh and aloes, where else do you find this in the scripture? Where is, what book of the Bible is literally dripping with liquid myrrh? Where are we? Shout it out. Song of Solomon. I'm going to make my wife nervous. Song of Solomon. Let's go back to Song of Solomon. You can look more of this up later, you know. Um, I don't know if I'll preach through Song of Solomon at one point, but um, it's a beautiful book and it's inspired by the Holy Spirit. And it's about the love between a man and a woman. It really is about that. And it points to Jesus in the church. It's about both. Because marriage points to Jesus in the church. But I, I want to read to you um, I want to read to you this one part here in uh, Song of Solomon, chapter 4, verse, verse 12. Now keep in mind, elsewhere, the woman, the, Sh the Shulamite, or the Shulamite, says this, A bundle of myrrh is my beloved to me, who rests between my breasts all night long. A bundle of myrrh, okay? <laughs> myrrh is the scent of love. Of romantic love. So, verse 12 A garden enclosed is my sister's spouse, a spring shut up, a fountain sealed. Your plants are an orchard of pomegranates with pleasant fruits, fragrant henna with spikenard, spikenard and saffron, calamus and cinnamon, with all trees of frankincense, myrrh and aloes. With all the chief spices, a fountain of gardens, a well of living waters, and streams from Lebanon. And here the woman responds, Awake, O north wind, and come, O south, blow upon my garden that its spices may flow out. Let my beloved come to his garden and eat its pleasant fruits. Woo! I will exegete that more. <laughs> This is hot stuff. <laughs> the devil did not invent, invent erotic art, artistry. God did. And he's subtle about it. He's not over the top about it. I'll stop there. But do you see this? Myrrh with both people. Myrrh. It's the, it's the scent of love. Um, aloes is known around the world as an aphrodisiac. And just think about this. In God's providence, okay? Big picture from eternity, right? Looking down at the whole Bible. So take it as a big picture. You've got King Jesus anointed at his burial with an aphrodisiac. This points to the wedding supper of the Lamb. Notice how the devil, um, he uh, counterfeits true, deep, healthy, holy, hot love in marriage. He counterfeits it. <coughs> Look, Proverbs 7. Notice where else? Yeah, Proverbs 7. You're thinking, how does this apply to me? We'll get there. <laughs> Hang in. Verse 6. For at the window of my house I looked through my lattice and saw among the simple, I perceived among the youths, a young man devoid of understanding, passing along the street near her corner. And he took the path to her house in the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night. And there a woman met him with the attire of a harlot and a crafty heart. She was loud and rebellious. Her feet would not stay at home. At times she was outside, at times in the open square, lurking at every corner. So she caught him and kissed him with an impudent face. She said to him, I have peace offerings with me. Today I have paid my vows. I'm a good church girl, you know? So I came out to meet you diligently to seek your face, and I have found you. 
I have spread my bed with tapestry, colored coverings of Egyptian linen. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love until morning. Let us delight ourselves with love. For my husband is not at home. He has gone on a long journey. He has taken a bag of money with him and will come home on the appointed day. Do you see the counterfeit? Now, in all likelihood, she didn't have all those expensive spices all over her bed, right? But she promised life to him. She held out the life that is, that is imaged in the intimacy of marriage. And she held it out in the context of adultery. And other places say, he did not know that her steps went down to death, to Sheol, to the place of the dead. Smells like life, but behind those closed doors is death. See the counterfeit? We, we like that bed. We like that bed. In our various forms of idolatry, it doesn't have to be lust. All idolatry is walking into that bedroom. Because only King Jesus is the fountain of living waters. And everything else is a broken cistern that can hold no water. And God is not only grieved by the fact that we take other lovers, he's grieved by the fact that they can't even satisfy. I know I've preached this over and over, but you get that? That grieves him. He wants you to have the real myrrh and aloes in the context of of holy union with Christ. Whether you're married on earth or not, if you're a Christian, you're married uh, to Jesus Christ. You're betrothed to one husband. And we're looking forward to the wedding uh, reception and the wedding night by the Holy Spirit. And this is what we need. We need to smell the garments of Jesus by faith as the garments of the risen one who has the scent of death on him because he took hell for us in our adulteries at the cross and died and rose again from the dead to cleave unto us while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. Like Hosea, he bought us out of prostitution with his own blood and brought us back into his bedroom, the bedroom of the king. And he calls out, Come out from your people. Leave your father's house also and get with the king. What does that mean for Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea? It meant that these men who were disciples of Jesus, but secretly we know from all the gospels that both of them sat on the Sanhedrin, the council of the elders. And uh, Nicodemus tried to stick up for Jesus a little earlier, you know, in the story in the gospels. But these guys were on the Sanhedrin. And I don't know if they weren't there that day or what, or if they just remained silent. But remember what Jesus said happens after the cross. He says, if I be lifted up, I will do what? Draw all men to myself. Just like the Roman soldiers who saw Jesus die, just like Pilate who saw Jesus be tortured and not retaliate, something about the suffering of the divine Son of God was powerful in these men's lives. And so Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, remember, go back to the gospel. Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, John is explicit about the secrecy of their discipleship. But he doesn't hesitate to call them disciples. Do you see the patience of the Lord? Look back at John 19, verse 38. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, he was a Jew, but he met the Jewish leaders, you know, he asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. What's he doing? He's forgetting his people and his father's house also. Being on the same Hedron, do you think that like the next time the Sanhedrin got together, they'd be like, hey, what's up, Joseph? Come on back. We're so glad to have you back. He was leaving his place of position and power. He wasn't going to be on that Sanhedrin anymore after he outed himself and as a Christian and asked for that body of Jesus. 
Look at what the love of our crucified King will do for cowards. Look at what that love does. Look at Nicodemus. John doesn't fail to mention, he mentioned even in another time thing about Nicodemus. Look at verse 39. And Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came not at night, is the implication, right? Nicodemus got courage. Perhaps he had been born again, right? He, he, he got courage. And he came to Jesus not at night and anointed his body with these spices. You see, these people in the leadership under the old covenant, <clears throat> secure in their power, position, and place in society of Israel, dropping, dropping all that. Going, all right, it's been real. And walking down the aisle, to Jesus. Who are your people? Who is your father's house? I think that's a legitimate thing to ask. Whose opinion of you, whose relationship with you, keeps you under their thumb and may hinder you from clinging more deeply to Jesus? I don't know what that looks like for you, but I suspect that for all of us, there are other beds, there are Sanhedrins, there are father's houses, whatever it is that, that keep you from communing with Jesus and experiencing a deeper satisfaction in Jesus. What are those things? What is Jesus calling you for? Now, you've already left in one sense and cling to Jesus as a Christian, right? But in a secondary, but I think very relevant way, to what extent does the fact that Jesus Christ smells like a funeral because he went to the cross for you, that's how much he loves you, girl. What, to what extent does that motivate you to leave these other things behind and just come and hug Jesus? put your head on his chest and get your face in his robes and enjoy the myrrh and the aloes and all the glorious spiritual realities to which those point. We have all sinned against the Lord. We have all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And that's not just before we were Christians. But the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. What confidence might you, who have been spending time in other beds, what, might, what confidence might you have to return to your bridegroom, knowing that he'll have a smile on his face? What confidence do you have? Smell his garments. It is finished. Amen. Pray.